praise the Lord. Are you excited to be in the presence of the Lord? Of course, we ought to be excited because the Bible says in his presence there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand is pleasure forevermore. Uh, we are so excited that he has again given us the opportunity to gather in his presence. As we continue on our study of God's word, I wish to ask the, the singers, um, the, the choristers, to uh, uh, join us up here. Let us please sing the first and last stanzas of Amazing Grace. All right, the first and last stanzas of Amazing Grace. All right, we can get at least one or two choristers to join us as we sing these stanzas of Amazing Grace. so much my brothers uh, it's it's amazing how God saved us the theme of this year's annual camp meeting is saved by the grace of God or saved by grace and the theme is actually based on or inspired by uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them that important text has a whole lot to say about how we are saved we are saved by grace we are saved through faith we are saved as a gift we are saved not of works we are saved for god and we are saved unto good works an amazing text indeed, and based on this text, the Lord has actually given us an outline of topics that we will be going through as we study together. The first topic which we actually looked at on yesterday is contours of saving grace. And we will look today at the topic, the concept of saving grace. And of course, we'll look at the conduit of saving faith, 
the contribution of God's saving gift, the corruption of men's self-saving works, the creative act of the Savior, and the conduct of uh, the saved. Those are what we'll be looking at as we go through our study. As you know, yesterday, we actually set the pace uh, for what we will be going through. We laid the foundation by putting Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 in its context. And the context, the literary context, or if you like, the pericope, the particular extra unit uh, from which Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 comes is actually uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 and we discussed those 10 verses under the theme contours of saving grace and we looked at two important points the God of grace and the grace of God Chapter one, uh, chapter two, verses one to seven, uh, is concerned with the God of grace. Chapter two, verses eight to ten, concerned with the grace of God. It was a fascinating study as we discovered, you know, the origin of grace. What's the origin of grace? The heart of a loving God. The objects of grace. Who are the objects of grace? We are the objects of grace. Sinners are the objects of God's saving grace. We also discuss the operation of saving grace. How God saved us through the substitutionary, you know, atonement of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we look at the outcome of saving grace. What's the outcome of saving grace? That sinners can become sins. Hallelujah. Sinners can become sins. So we bless the Lord for his word. This morning we are continuing our study of the word of God. And the theme for this morning's topic, I mean presentation or the topic of this morning's uh, presentation is the concept of saving grace. And of course we have as our key text Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. Kindly turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. And as you turn the pages of your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, permit me to once more affirm my belief in the Bible as the word of God. My dear friends, I affirm the primacy of the Bible, that the Bible is the ultimate authority. If that is an affirmation too, can't they say amen? I also affirm the sufficiency of the Bible, that the Bible is sufficient to make one wise unto salvation. If you believe that with me, can't they say amen? And finally, I affirm the totality of the Bible that all scripture comprising the Old and New Testaments and 66 books is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly furnished for all good works. If you believe that women can't let's say amen. So with that conviction, I wish to read with you Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. You're going to read with me and I will read uh, uh, to your hearing after we have all read together. Okay, so let us go together. Ready, go. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, let, me, let me read to your hearing Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The topic, the concept of saving grace. The concept of saving grace. Let's ask the Lord to lead us as we study his wonderful word of life. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study your wonderful word of life. As it has pleased you today, O oh loving Father, to use a frail, a filthy, and a feeble person like me. 
I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom to move the crowd. Or ask, O oh Lord, is let humanity diminish and let divinity dominate. Speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally in the name of Jesus. Let God's people say, Amen. The topic the concept of saving grace. My dear brothers and sisters, to understand the biblical concept of saving grace, we are going to analyze this portion of Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8, that reads, For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. And as you analyze this particular portion of the text, we are going to actually highlight four important points. And the first is the purpose or the reason of salvation by grace. We will also consider the process of salvation by grace, the phases of salvation by grace, and the products of salvation by grace. Now let's look at the first point of our study, the purpose of salvation by grace or the reason of salvation by grace. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, for, for by grace you have been saved. The, the text begins with the word for. Why for? For is a favorite little three-letter word of the Apostle Paul. In the Greek, it is God. It is a conjunction. It is an explanatory conjunction. In fact, the English word for is actually used in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, but it is not used in the Greek. So, Definitely, there are different prepositions that are translated for in those occurrences in chapter 1, verses 15 and 18. I'm talking about the Greek word ga, which is used in the original text of the book of Ephesians. Paul often uses the word, he loves to explain things. He delights in getting caught up in explaining the purpose of why things happen. And he usually employs that word ga or for. As a matter of fact, Paul used the little word for nine times from the beginning of the book of Romans up to Romans chapter 2 verse 11. The word for is also used in Galatians chapter 2 verse 8 the fifth time. In Ephesians, Paul uses the word for 11 times. And so Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 is the first time that Paul uses the word in the Greek. He uses the word for. It is rather peculiar, my dear brothers and sisters, that he has not used this familiar word of his until this point in the book of Ephesians. The conjunction for is a term of explanation which always calls us to pause and ponder. It always calls us to pause and ponder. Oh dear brothers and sisters, why did he wait on to Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8 before using the word for? You see, there is a reason for this. And the reason could be that the word is used now to explain what is mentioned in chapter 2 verse number uh, 7. Chapter 2 verse 7 talks about the exceeding riches of his grace. So chapter 2 verse 8 might be Paul's explanation of the exceeding riches of his grace. Not just that, my dear brothers and sisters, he seems to actually be elaborating on the parenthetical statement in chapter 2 verse 5 where the Bible says, "For I mean, by grace you have been saved. So he might be here actually elaborating on that particular statement in chapter 2, verse number 5. The truth is, Paul had been explaining this concept of salvation from chapter 2, verse 1. He goes on 
to chapter 2, verse 2, uh, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. And then he comes to it, he says, let's take a break and reflect on the reason for these things. So the first thing we see is the purpose for our salvation. So if we conclude that Paul is explaining, okay, chapter 2, verse number 7, then what then is the purpose of salvation? Notice what chapter 2, verse 7 says. It says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is the reason for our salvation or the purpose of our salvation. What is that purpose? God saved us by grace alone so that he might display us as trophies of his grace. The text says that in the ages to come, he must show the exceeding riches of his grace. In the ages to come, he might actually, you know, display us as the true face of his grace, the victory won by the grace of God. So the word for tells us the purpose of our salvation. And that purpose of salvation by grace is that God would display us as trophies of his grace. If that is clear, say amen to God. The second thing we see in the text is the process of salvation. Notice what the text says. It says for by grace. By grace. As a matter of fact, if you look at that in the Greek, literally it is by the grace. There is an article there. By the grace. Now, the fact that he uses the definite article there may suggest that he is simply referring back to grace, which is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 5, or grace, which is mentioned in chapter 2, verse number 7. By the grace. By the specific saving grace. By the specific exceedingly rich grace. By the grace. He says, by the grace. Now, this is interesting. What does it mean by by grace? You see, the preposition by is very important. Paul says we are saved by the grace. This prepositional phrase is constructed in the ancient language of the New Testament by use of what they call the dative case. That is the case of the indirect object. It is used to signify means. The means by which we are saved. By the grace, by means of the grace, we are saved. By means, so grace is presented as the means of our salvation. The Bible says, by the grace. The word grace is an interesting word as well. That word charis, very interesting. In the New Testament, charis actually means gift, favor, credit, or kindness, inclined to benefit, undeserved blessing. In, in, in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew uses the word chen, and, and chen means favor. It means acceptance. It means to stoop down in kindness. Acceptance by God. The stooping down of God to shower us with his kindness, to bestow his kindness on us. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, the word grace has come to me in the Christian context, the unmerited favor of God, the undeserved gift of God, the unearned favor of God. In fact, someone has created a very fascinating acrostic for the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, and the person says grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Dear brothers and sisters, it is Augustine who says God gives where he finds empty hands. That is grace. That is grace. And as we look at the process of grace, it is important to note that grace is multifaceted. Grace is multidimensional. There are aspects of grace. It is a 
colorful concept in the word of God. Let me improve that first Peter chapter 4 verse 10. In 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10, the Bible says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards. Now notice the point. Good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold grace of God. The multifaceted grace of God. The multidimensional grace of God. It has many different forms and elements. Dear brothers and sisters, what is this grace by which we are saved? What is this unmerited favor of God? I give you the first point. Grace is saving. Grace is saving. In other words, it is saving grace. Notice what the Bible says in Acts chapter 15 verse 11. In Acts chapter 15 verse 11, the Bible says, But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. In the same way as they also are. So grace saves. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So grace has, I mean, a saving. We call it saving grace. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, there is also what we call securing grace. That's another dimension of the grace of God. Securing grace. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. Therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have obtained an introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. The grace which secures us. So grace is securing. Notice also what the Bible says here in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 12. Through Servinius, okay, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exalting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. That he says, stand firm in it. Stand firm in it. We are to be secured in the grace of God. Secured by the grace of God. We have a security because of the divine grace of God. Notice what the Bible also says. Our third point. The third dimension of the grace of God is it has sanctifying power. Grace sanctifies. The Bible says in Acts chapter 13 verse 43. The Bible says now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up many of the Jews and the God-fearing Priscilla's followed Paul and Barnabas who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Continuing in grace is the same as walking in grace which is the same as being sanctified by the grace of God. The Bible also says talking about the sanctifying power of grace in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 the Bible says but by the grace of God, I am who I am. I am what I am. And his grace to what I mean did not prove in. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. So grace assists or aids in our sanctification. So there is a sanctifying power of the grace of God. But that is not all, my dear brothers and sisters. There is also, let, let me give you another text, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The Bible says, but grow in grace. That's sanctification. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. But dear brothers and sisters, here is the fourth dimension of the grace of God. The fourth element of the grace of God is serving gift or serving grace. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. The Bible says, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace empowers us to serve. It empowers us for service to God and to humanity. The Bible says we should be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. How should we be? By serving one another. By serving one another. So the grace of God empowers us for service. If that is clear, say amen to God. 
So the grace of God is actually saving grace. The grace of God is securing grace. The grace of God is sanctifying grace. The grace of God is serving grace. The grace of God is also sustaining grace. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the Bible says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, here is a man who had prayed for God's healing because he had a thorn in his flesh. And God comes back to him and says, Listen, brother, my grace is sufficient. The grace of God sustains us in our pains, sustains us in our perplexities, sustains us in our troubles, sustains us in our difficulties, sustains us in our adversities. The grace of God is sustaining. The Bible also says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. When we have need, the grace of God helps us. Hallelujah. That word help in the Greek, is a powerful word, boy. It is a powerful word against the background or the idea of a child learning to walk. And as this child tries to walk, the child begins to fall. And then a caring mother or a caring father rushes to the rescue of the child. That is the meaning of help, to rush to the rescue of. And the Bible says grace, we will find grace to help in time of need it means that the grace of god will pursue us the grace of god will come after us the grace of god will lift us up when we fall lift us up when we slip lift us up when we are in the merry clay of this life if that is clear say amen to god dear brothers and sisters we have seen the purpose of salvation by grace which is that god may display us as the trophies of his grace we have seen the process of saving grace. We are saved by grace. And now we go to the third point. The faces of saving grace. The faces of saving grace. Notice what the Bible says. For by grace, it says, you have been saved. You have been saved. By the grace of God. Hallelujah. Now that is a powerful expression. Actually, you have been saved. Those four words actually are translation of one word in the Greek. It is one word that is translated as you have been saved. That word is the verb suzo. But you see, the form in which it is used in the Greek is actually sesos menoi. Sesos menoi. It is presented that way in order that it will be in a perfect passive participle. The perfect passive participle. Now, this is fascinating. Let me tell you why. The verb is in the passive voice. I feel like preaching already. The verb is in a passive voice. And what that means is that the act of saving is something which is being done to me or for me. It's in a passive voice. I am not saving myself. Salvation is something that is being done for me. That is something that is being done to me. So it is not myself who saves myself. It is God who is doing the saving. I thought somebody has gotten that revelation. It is God who is doing the saving on me. It is by his grace alone that I am being saved. If that is clear, say amen. It means I am making no contribution. I repeat, I am making no contribution to my salvation. Hallelujah. I am making no contribution to my salvation. So that is the essence of the verb being in the passive voice. 
But that is not all. The verb is in the perfect tense. The perfect tense emphasizes an action initiated in the past. The effect of which continues into the present and beyond. God have mercy. The perfect tense suggests that this action has taken place in the past. But the effect of the action continues now and beyond. Therefore, salvation has a moment of initiation and that is called justification. Salvation has a result which I am experiencing now and that is called sanctification. And salvation has a moment when it will be consummated in glory and that is called glorification. Those are the three faces of salvation. Now come with me dear brothers and sisters. Basically what this means is I am saved. This states a present condition. I was saved. It will specify that this happened in the past. But if you say I have been saved which will make it the passive and the perfect okay it will mean that my salvation began in the past but it continues into the future if that is clear say amen to god salvation is both an event in time and the entire process by which God rescues sinful human beings from their bondage to sin giving them an overhaul from inside out Oh, dear brothers and sisters, salvation is accomplished in three phases. How many phases? How many phases? Salvation is accomplished in three phases or three tenses. Past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. Now let's explore some biblical texts to support this. The Bible says if, in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verses 8 to 11, the Bible says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been, having now been justified, we have been justified, that's in the past, are you that with me? By his blood, we shall be saved. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So we have been justified in the past. We will be saved from the wrath of God in the future. The wrath of God is the hell fire. The wrath of God is the seven last plague. The wrath of God is the undiluted justice of God which will be levered against sin. And the Bible says having been in the past justified freely by his blood we shall be saved from his wrath i don't go to the judgment with fear i go to the judgment with the verdict in my pocket what is the verdict romans chapter 8 verse 1 there is therefore there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus hallelujah the verdict has been put down the verdict has been mentioned. I'm no longer condemned. But brothers and sisters, the text says we've been saved from wrath through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved again. Did you get that? We shall be saved by his life. Now this is powerful. We were saved from the wrath of God through him. Then we are saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exhort in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul is actually lingering between the three tenses or faces of salvation, past, present, and future. But there is a text that makes it clearer. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. That is what the text says. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, the Bible says, Who delivered us? Can we read this together? Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us? Are you serious? He delivered us. He does deliver us. We shall be delivered by him. Meaning that, we are saved. We are being saved. 
and we will be saved. Are you there with me, brothers and sisters? We are saved is justification. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's the meaning of justification. God has saved us from the penalty of sin. Justification is an act of grace whereby God declares that the, all the demands of his law have been fulfilled by the believer by means of the atoning death of Jesus Christ. God declares the sinner righteous on account of the Savior's redemptive death. That is justification. Justification is a declaration. You simply believed in God. And then God took that little thing that the lawyers or the judges use and knocked it on that uh, you know, table of the universe and says... You are legally equated. Justification is legal equator. Justification is a declaration of righteousness. Justification is actually the pronouncement that you are no longer guilty. That is justification. It means that God sees you as if you have never sinned. Are you there with me? God sees you as if you have never sinned. But why does he see me as if I have never sinned? Because God made him sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, God sees us as if we have never sinned because we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Lord our righteousness hallelujah declared righteous that is the verdict righteous and then we go to sanctification sanctification is we are being saved from the power of sin God saved us from the penalty of sin and then he is saving us from the power of sin. That is justification. That is sanctification. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is the continuous operation of the Holy Spirit in the believer, making them holy by conforming their character, their affection, their attitudes, their thinking, their behavior to the image of Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, there's an interesting comparison between justification and sanctification. You see, in justification, justification is by grace. Sanctification is by grace. Justification is instantaneous. Sanctification is a lifelong process. Justification is by faith. Sanctification results in faithfulness. Justification is not of works. Sanctification includes good works. Justification concerns Christ's imputed righteousness. Sanctification concerns Christ's imparted righteousness. The growing in the righteousness of God. Justification involves my position in Christ. Sanctification Sanctification involves my practice in Christ. Justification considers what God has done. Sanctification considers what God is doing through me and in me and by me and with me. Justification is God's commitment to me. Sanctification is my commitment to God by his grace. Justification requires obedience to one command and that is to believe the gospel. Sanctification requires obedience to all the commandments of Christ Jesus. Jesus. Justification focuses on the cross which Jesus took once and for all for my sin. But sanctification focuses on the cross which I am taking daily for the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is clear, say amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, justification is finished at the moment of faith. But sanctification is not finished until we see him. And we are changed into his image. Until he comes in glory and we go with him. Until we reach the stage of what the Bible calls glorification. That is when we shall be saved from the presence of sin. 
Oh, brothers and sisters, justification is the past tense of salvation. Separation from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is the present tense of salvation, separating us from the power of sin. And glorification is the future tense of salvation, separating us from the presence of sin. Let's close this message by looking at our fourth point. Our fourth point. And the fourth point is the products of salvation. The products of salvation. Look at the text again. The Bible says, for by grace, you have been saved. For by grace, you have been saved. This pronoun you is powerful. You, are you serious? The last time Paul used the word you in this chapter was in chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And in chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, he says that you were dead in trespasses and sins. He said you were walking to the cause of this world. You were a worldly person. He said you were living according to the will of Satan. How come now, he says by grace, you have been saved. You, you who have been sinners, you who have been dead, you who have been satanic, you who have been followers of the devil, you who have laid according to the allurements of this world, you who have followed your tendencies, your inclinations, your propensities to do evil, you have been saved. Brothers and sisters, that's the products of salvation. I am a living product of the grace of God. That a sinner, a wretched sinner, a frail sinner, a monster sold on a sin could be rescued by the God of heaven as a product of his grace. If that is clear, say amen to God. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, when the reformer said, Sola Grisha, when they said grace alone as the only means of our salvation, they were reacting to Roman Catholicism's error. Roman Catholicism taught that it is God's grace plus men's effort that accomplish salvation. God's grace plus men's effort accomplish salvation. That is the Roman Catholic position that is held on to even now. And the truth is, some of you wonderful Adventist brothers and sisters, you are Catholics in your understanding of the grace of God. Are you there with me? You think that you are saved by grace plus Sabbath observance. Are you there with me? You are saved by grace plus punctuality in coming to church services. You are saved by grace plus Keeping the commandments of God. Well, I'm here to let you know, my dear brothers and sisters, that is why the reformers revolted against. That is why the church stood against. We are not saved by grace plus work. We are saved by grace alone. I said by grace alone. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, the protestants said no. Grace is the sole means of our justification. Now, notice what Ellen White says as we wrap up. Ellen White says in Selected Messages, book 1, page 398. Grace is unmerited favor. And the believer is justified without any merit of his own. Without any claim to offer to God. He is justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who stands in the courts of heaven as the sinner's substitute and surety. Are you there with me? Are you there with me? Jesus stands as our substitute and surety. He is in our place, and he is the guarantee that we will go where he is. He said, where I am, there you will be also. Hallelujah. Christ in heaven 
is the highest, the greatest, the strongest evidence I have that I'm going to heaven. Are you there with me? Are you there with me? Dear brothers and sisters, Ellen White continues. She says in Faith and Works, that's interesting. Faith and Works, that's the name of the book, uh, uh, page 19 and also page, page 20. She says, let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to effect anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. Creature merit. That means works you do that you think are meritorious. In other words, they gain you favor with God. Let me go to church on time so God can smile on me. Let me keep his commandment so God can justify me. Are you joking? Not by works. Lest any man should boast. But by the grace of God alone, if that is clear, say amen. Notice what she said. She said, notice, Ellen White says the reason for this is, the reason why creature merit doesn't get a credit. Are you there with me? The reason why creature merit doesn't get a credit is simple. She says, should faith, take note of this, and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the creator is under obligation to the creature. Did you get that? She says, here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. If man cannot, by any of his good works, merit salvation, then it must be holy of grace. Can somebody say that? Holy of grace. Holy of grace. Received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in Jesus. It is holy a free gift. Two expressions Ellen White gives here. Number one, holy of grace. Salvation is holy of grace. Salvation is holy a free gift. Oh, brothers and sisters, Ellen White says we owe everything to grace. Free grace, sovereign grace, grace in the covenant ordained our adoption, grace in the Savior effected our redemption, our regeneration, and our adoption to heirship with Christ Jesus. The message today is the concept of saving grace. And the first thing we look at as we consider the concept of saving grace, looking at the word for, we consider the purpose of salvation by grace. The purpose is that God would display us as trophies of his grace. Hallelujah. 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 The purpose of salvation by grace. And we went on to look at another fascinating point after the purpose of salvation by grace. And that point, my dear brothers and sisters, is the process of salvation by grace. We are saved by means of grace. And then we look at the faces of salvation by grace. We are saved. We are being saved. And we shall be saved. We shall be saved. Some others say, ah, but go oh, I get stuck somewhere along the way? Justification is the certificate that you will be sanctified and you will be glorified. This is God's way of saying, hey, I am going to not stop at just declaring you righteous. I'm going to demonstrate righteousness through you. Are you there with me? I'm going to work in you both to will and to do my good pleasure. And finally, I will glorify you. What does that mean? Paul says he will present to himself a faultless church. He will present to himself a church which is clean. He will present to himself a glorious church. That's interesting. It means that he will wash the church with his blood. Are you there with me? The Confucianist church, the fighting church, the, the wayward church, the sin sick church, 
the rebellious church will be washed with the blood of the lamb what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus and the song says the blood of Jesus will never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God are saved to sin no more and when he's done with that he will take this pure church and present the church to himself and say to himself thank you for saving this church and then this church will take off its crowns and put them at the feet of Jesus saying that all that we are all that we have ever been all that we have done were simply by your grace Hallelujah. If the grace of God doesn't fascinate you, there's a problem with you. You know, humans have, it's as if there's an insatiable desire to work for some things. You understand that? Humans love working for stuff. I'm, my Adventist brothers, are you there with me? You got to keep the Sabbath holy. Then God will justify you. Are you kidding me? Ah! Good works are not meritorious. They don't gain favor with God. Good works are as a result of gratitude. That's the way of saying thank you, Lord, for saving me. Hallelujah. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this mighty message. We thank you for this glorious grace. We thank you for this sovereign salvation. We honor you that you save us in spite of our frailties and filthiness and feebleness. That your grace is sufficient for us. That you have justified us by a forensic and jurisprudential declaration of equator, of righteousness. For Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. And you are saving us by the great impartation of the Holy Spirit who is conforming our minds, our hearts, our attitudes to the image of Jesus Christ, who is restoring God's image in us, that which was mired and deliberated by sin. We thank you that you will ultimately save us on that glorious day when the dead in Christ will rise first and the living in Christ will be caught up with them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a glorious privilege of God that you could save us in spite of ourselves. Be glorified, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.